Gays and lesbians run major media in this country. They just do. They know I was in the same thing that they were in. They know that I was stuck in the same flesh, you know, struggle that they were stuck in. But I am free. He loves you just like you are. But he's waiting for you to love him just like he is. Now gay characters have major talk shows. It, it, they really have taken over media. Why? Because media speaks directly into the minds of young people. And that's how you change society, by changing the mind of the youngest person. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is Jason Graves and I'm your host for today's program. Hey, imagine you're a very successful editor of a national magazine devoted to the black lesbian community. You're highly respected in your field and featured prominently in gay activist literature, conferences, and media appearances. You're a role model for young black lesbians around the world. Now imagine you discover that God is not pleased with what you're doing or the lifestyle you're living, and you become convicted by the Holy Spirit to turn away from homosexuality and give your life to Jesus Christ. Then imagine being so bold as to continue speaking at gay events and publishing your magazine for black lesbians, only now you're urging your hearers and readers to repent and turn to the Lord and be saved. I've not read of a more dramatic and bold turnaround since I last read the story of Paul the Apostle being converted on the road to Damascus. Charlene Cothran is our guest on today's program, and she's the lady who's lived the life I just described and who boldly continues to proclaim the glory of the Lord to everyone who will listen. So let's you and I listen to this incredible story. Let's meet Charlene Cothran. As I look back, I see that the devil deceived me, and he deceived many, many uh, thousands and thousands of others into believing that we could uh, be happy. You know, that's the deception that this is a happy life. This is a gay life. This is a gay pride. We are happy. None of that is true. None of that is true. I began to organize uh, social events for lesbians of color at the time. Myself and I had two other business partners and we were a perfect fit. We would rent restaurants and invite women to come and uh, sort of uh, amass a, a, a mail list. And women would come from all over the region. And on a, any holiday night, uh, the group was called Hospitality Atlanta. It would not be um, odd to have seven, eight hundred women exclusively packed into a beautiful restaurant with we hired police at the door and would not let a man in. And from those events, we we had softball leagues and softball teams, and then and, and uh, major you know picnics and whatnot. It was just a, a, a great at that time we thought organization. We made a lot of money. And uh, we did that for nearly 10 years. And when we got older and decided that we didn't want to do it anymore, you know, I decided, well, what are we going to do with this mail list? And from that mail list, uh, I decided to launch uh, a magazine. The gay and lesbian political community began to pay attention to the fact that we could bring um, numbers of black lesbians and gays together uh, through the work that we were doing. And then when the magazine was launched, surely uh, we began to get uh, contacted by HRC, Human Rights Campaign, and the Victory Fund, and uh, many of the gay organizations who are, who, who are uh, doing a lot of work right now. And we were, it was a very important part um, in the early 90s of the work that they were doing because uh, at that time they were being told by local uh, politicians and regional politicians and national politicians that, okay, you guys are rich, you are guys are a group of rich white gay men. And you wanted to change laws just for you. No, we don't see a coalition of people here. So it was important then to be able to raise up or show a Charlene Cawthorn or a, Vic or a Venus magazine to say, oh, no, there's a huge, vibrant black gay community. Look at that through the pages of Venus magazine. So we were an important part of what they were trying to present. But the strategy is always to get one little foot in the door. When in fact, uh, the plan means we're going to take over the whole thing. Well, why don't we just get uh, a, a, a statement, uh, Mr. School Board President, in your 
school board policy that you simply acknowledge the fact that we, we will not we will, we will not fire a gay teacher or that there may be some gay students that we're going to be uh, okay with, you know, um, not trying not to be prejudiced toward them through our policy. We just want one little statement in the booklet when in fact the plan is to take over the whole school system as we see now 15 years later is happening. There's always just, you know, that's the strategy just to get in under the wire and then once you get enough of our people in then to do some major work. I was asked to help with domestic partnership, the, the, uh, get the domestic partnership bill passed in Atlanta, Georgia, and they helped to train me to go in and speak with council people and to speak with uh, the mayor. And of course, they chose not only uh, people of color, but also people who were landowners. Of course, I owned a home at that time and, and people who had a good, strong voting record. That was also... Um, very important. And so um, we would go in under the wire and basically what, what we were trained is that don't talk to anybody else about this. All we want to do is get in, talk to the council people. We don't even want the church folk to, 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 to understand that this vote is coming up soon. We want to be able to fill the auditorium on vote day with all gay and lesbian landowners so that the politicians will say, my God, we kind of have to do this. That's the strategy. That's the strategy. They were able to uh, infiltrate media. Uh, and even people, you know, I look at people who started out, even with my small publication, people who started out with Venus Magazine and were able to take, um, you know, tear sheets from our book um, are now working for some major newspapers, working for Bloomberg, working for the New York Times, working for Condé Nast. And so it, it's so true. It's like they, you know, they gays and lesbians run major media in this country. They just do. And I don't, I'm not sure how many if the church really. Well, maybe the evangelical church realizes that. But gays and lesbians really are um, at the forefront of me, major media decisions. And so then sitcoms. Um, Every sitcom, they, they, you know, I've heard that every sitcom is going to have a gay character, and it's coming true. It really is. And, of course, now gay characters have major talk shows. It, it, they really have taken over media. Why? Because media speaks directly into the minds of young people. And that's how you change society, by changing the mind of the youngest person. One of the finest teaching resources that we have here at Pure Passion is a four-lecture series by Dr. Robert Gagnon titled Love, the Bible, and Homosexual Practice. In his presentation, Dr. Gagnon explores one of the most important and contested issues in the church today. If two people of the same sex love each other, is this enough to justify a marriage? How should the Christian principle of love inform our response? Does the Bible teach that Jesus would have opposed committed homosexual relationships? Did the Apostle Paul oppose homosexual behavior only when it involves slaves, prostitution, and other exploitive practices? Does the Old Testament culture provide a consistent witness against homosexual practice? What do modern understandings of nature and science teach us? And how can we best minister to persons with same-gender attractions? To obtain the series Love, the Bible, and Homosexual Practice on CD or DVD, just go to purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. I hadn't planned on shifting out of it. <laughs> I was doing just well. You know, I had a, a magazine that was on automatic pilot. I was doing uh, very, very well. And at the top of what I thought was my career, my mother passed away. And that change, that was the beginning of the change that God was setting up for me uh, because I'm the oldest of two. And uh, now my grandmother, who has Alzheimer's, becomes my responsibility. Here I am in the middle of a 10-year relationship with another woman. Uh, and uh, we're living together in New York, and my grandmother is now living with us. And my life changed uh, in so many ways. Uh, I wasn't able to get to all those functions I used to run and go to. Um, I was barely getting Venus out. But God was showing me what eternity looks like. Because when I had to bury my mother, uh, I, I had a decision to make about a plot to buy, okay, my mom. My grandmother is is my responsibility, and then I've got to go. I'm you know I'm unmarried, you know whatever. But I I, I bought a three grave plot in our family cemetery, and it was a huge reminder to me when I would go and put f f uh, flowers on my mother's grave that that's where my mother's gonna be, that's where my mother is. This is where my grandmother's gonna be, and this is where you're going to be. And when you when you look at 
you know, your mortality. It really forces you to think about what's beyond this grave. And I was forced to think about that. And having, again, that seed of righteousness that was way down in me from, again, that 12-year-old got saved experience and being forced now at 42 to say, where are you really going to spend eternity? Just getting buried in this ground is not it. This is not over. What's going to happen after that? And that may come sooner than you think. That began to change uh, just uh, the way I saw the gay life. Now, did I continue to publish the magazine? Yes. And I went to some, you know, events? Yes. But I, I saw uh, th that people were not paying attention to the ever after. In fact, they avoided it. And I, I could never, I was never one to go to a gay church. You know, that just never sat well with me. I, I knew it wasn't real. I knew that was not um, the God of my understanding. The only God there is. Uh, and I could not um, get in line with that, so I vo so I just didn't go to church uh, very often, except to a family gathering or function. But um, facing um, my mortality, looking at my mortality, forced me to begin to think about uh, things that are spiritual. And 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 then there were times, you know, in my soul that I wanted someone to share with me how I could get out of this captivity that I was in. I mean, it w certainly I had the knowledge of Christ, but I did not know that I could uh, be free in my flesh again. I always struggled with that. Can I ever be free in my flesh? Can I ever not want a woman? Can I ever not look at a woman and desire her? Can I, can I ever break free of that? That is how, why, how I struggled. And um, one day, uh, again, uh, here I am, you know, in New Jersey, and a, and a pastor happened to call me on the phone. Wonderful woman of God, um, and she asked me. She said, "Charlene, you know, we discussed our business, and I guess there was just something the Lord prompted uh, her to ask me, where are you in the Lord?'" And I said to her, um, "You know, you know, in my in my spirit, I wanted her really to 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 help me with this dilemma. How do I get free of my flesh? I said, but if you discuss the flesh with her, the kind of flesh you're talking about, this woman, woman thing, this woman is going to, you know, run and hang up the phone and, and never talk to you again. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. She listened to me go on. And then something, uh, my pride kicked in and something said, well, just tell her about all the accomplishments you've also made as a lesbian. You've published, you've traveled, you've done this, you've done that. And let her know that, that even the money you make from your gay publication is the one is what allows you to do the small community publication for them. It's, it's gay dollars that support it. You know? So all of that kicked in. And she allowed me to go on and on. And she said, let me tell you something. She said, I can see in, in, in the spirit that you want Want to come back to Christ, but you can't figure out how to be to, to you can you, you know how to get free, but you can't figure out how to stay free. And you feel as though God can't use you because you've been so public about your lesbianism. She said God intends to use all of that. And something began to unlock and unravel just at that time, and just that stony ground began to break up so she could get some word uh, in me. Um, God just sort of shut me up. I, I was speechless for several minutes. I could not speak. All I could do was listen and tears just flow down because she would just hit something that was so true. It was so true. I wanted to be free in that moment. You know, God said to me, look, you're going to choose this day who you're going to serve. You know, I've been here. I've loved you. I've protected you. I've gotten you out of this situation and that situation. I've helped you. I've, you have seen me divide the world. And he has in, in many occasions. Even as an unsaved person, I recognize the hand of God moving. My God, that had to be God. I couldn't have done that myself. You know, particularly after my mother died, diff, you know, several things happened that were just a setup. I know that it was God. And, and I'm like, God, why? And I, and I thought to myself, he's doing this for grandma. I, you know, it was never for me because I certainly I didn't deserve it. But God showed me it was me doing that. It was, and that's how he wins us, by the loving kindness and compassion he has toward us. And, and he said, okay, now I've done all that. And I'm telling you now, today is your day. You're going to choose. And if you choose me, that I'm going to use you. I'm going to make you so happy. And I'm going to use everything uh, that I, all the gifts that I had developed in you. I'm going to use all of that for my own, my own glory. But if you say no, if you refuse me today, then I'm going to allow you to just go on and drift off and do whatever you want. 
But at the end of that road, there will be judgment. And I'm not, today is the day you will choose. And I've, I heard that very clearly and very loudly as, I, as much as I'm, uh, just as clearly as I'm speaking to you today. He spoke that into my spirit. And I said, no, I'm going to choose you today, God. And I, and, and of course, the, the enemy is, is speaking in the other year. Well, what about, you know, what about your income? You can't stop publishing Venus Magazine. You know, my entire, all of my debt load was, ba- was built on, you know, a certain income coming in every, every quarter from, from the publication. I have mortgages. I have, you know, car notes. I have, I have all the debt that, that is associated with your income. And I, and I said, you know what? I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to do it. All I know is I've got to trust God in this moment, and I've got to choose God in this moment. Oh, yeah, well, what about the speaking engagement that you've already been paid to go to New York City to the Schomburg, you know, New York City Gay Pride? You're going to have to do that. What are you going to go there and say? You're going to, you can't get saved today is what the enemy kept saying. You can't get saved today. And I'm like, you know, I don't know what I'm going to go there and say, but I know that I'm going there as a saved person because I'm choosing the Lord today. And, and, you know, it seemed like after I just gave the enemy the last blow, he just said, okay, well, let me go bother somebody else. And then tears just began to flow. And I felt the overcoming of the Holy Spirit in me like I have never felt before. Something just churned down on the inside. God began to break up some ground in me. And... um I cried in that car, and, and the pastor stayed on the phone, and she asked me, uh, will you pray the sinner's prayer with me? Because she asked me twice before, and I said no, because all these com- you know things were going off in my head. But the third time, she's so persistent, and I thank God for that. She was so persistent. The third time she asked me if you would pray the sinner's prayer with me, then I, uh, I said yes, and I prayed the sinner's prayer with her, and the Lord came into my heart uh, that day. The very next thing uh, after getting saved that Tuesday was that I uh, I went on to uh, Schaumburg. And this was about two weeks later. I went on to the Schaumburg. I didn't call ahead and let them know that I was going to have uh, some, you know, I had a change of life. I just said, you know, God, you're going to show me. And uh, he'd already shown me in, in just a passage of scripture that, you know, don't worry about what you're going to say. I will give you the perfect timing and I will give you the perfect word to share in the perfect moment. And it, but on the other side of my mind, I'm like, yeah, but I know the gay and lesbian community. I'm like, oh, my goodness, they're going to have a fit. <laughs> they're going to have some kind of fit on me. And uh, I won't I won't say that I wasn't frightened because I was now um, I was part of a panel discussion. I wasn't a keynote. And these, these were all publishers. These were people who I traveled with before every time we would go to a session you know we knew who, who each other there was a book publisher and the magazine publisher and the one who just got a new book out so we we're all sitting there we we're all sharing about our experiences and the host uh, of course would ask a series of questions and I think the first set of questions was uh, how did you all get started and certainly shared how Venus got started and everybody else did and um uh, how did you gather the, the the audience that you have now so I was able to share that but when he the last question he closed with was where uh, do you see uh, your publication going now? And I knew that that was that, that, that the door that God opened. This is where you tell them. And so I began to say, I said, you know, the direction of Venus is going to change 180 degrees. We're going uh, in totally in an opposite direction. Our mission up until now has been to encourage gays and lesbians to stand up and be who they are, you know, in the community and come out of the closet and be proud and let your parents and neighborhoods know. We're going now in the opposite direction. We want to let gays and lesbians know that this is not what God intended. And I tell you that you could hear a pin drop in that auditorium. The host, the other, I, I wouldn't look to the left or the right at, the, at my friends. And I try not to see, see faces, you know. I try like Jeremiah. I don't even look at their faces. Just say what God says and let it go forth and let the chips fall where they may. And I said, this is not what God intended. And Venus is going to now uh, instruct people on how to get out of homosexuality. And not only that, but you can't just get out on your own, that it takes a committed relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he's done for me. And, you know, it was time for others to speak, but it was like, you know, it took a while for the silence to break up. And I just, I, I let it sit, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with silence sometimes. And I didn't say anything and they didn't say anything for a minute. And the host, when he finally got over the shock of it, went on to the next speaker. But then uh, a little fright set in because, of course, there was a reception immediately, a- immediately afterwards. And I thought, oh, my God, get out of here. Don't go to the reception. Run to your car and get back to New Jersey real quickly. Don't take any questions. Just go. And uh, the Lord began to say, no, if this is your ministry, then this is where you begin. You're going to stay 
and you're gonna you're gonna take whatever uh, you know comes. And I thought, okay, well, they're going to be uh, pretty ice cold to me. I'm going to be, you know, pretty isolated, you know, at this reception. And, you know, you're going to be standing here and the rest of the crowd are going to be over there kind of looking at you like she's lost her mind. But that didn't happen either. Um, as I stood at that reception, one by one, a person would come over to me and say, you know, um, I used to go to church and I'm not happy in this life. And I want to get out too. I had another uh, woman come over to me and say, you know what? I used to be a minister and I backslid. And that's the only reason I'm in this life. One by one, souls begin to come and say to me, thank you for sharing that, for saying that, for being bold enough to say that in this setting. And I knew then what God had in store, that he was going to, 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 to raise up not only my voice, there are many, He's raising up a new nation who has experienced this thing. And so now these people can't look at me the same way they might look at a Baptist preacher or a Pentecostal preacher who's not walked in those shoes. They can't look at me and say, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She's just being prejudiced against me. They know I was in the same thing that they were in. They know that I was stuck in the same flesh, you know, struggle that they were stuck in. But I am free. One of the finest teaching resources that we have here at Pure Passion is a four-lecture series by Dr. Robert Gagnon titled Love, the Bible, and Homosexual Practice. In his presentation, Dr. Gagnon explores one of the most important and contested issues in the church today. If two people of the same sex love each other, is this enough to justify a marriage? How should the Christian principle of love inform our response? Does the Bible teach that Jesus would have opposed committed homosexual relationships? Did the Apostle Paul oppose homosexual behavior only when it involves slaves, prostitution, and other exploitive practices? Does the Old Testament culture provide a consistent witness against homosexual practice? What do modern understandings of nature and science teach us? And how can we best minister to persons with same-gender attractions? To obtain the series Love, the Bible, and Homosexual Practice on CD or DVD, just go to purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. There, there's a song that, are, that, that my pastor is teaching right now in our choir. It's called, The Lord is in this place. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. He's in this place. And it's not talking about a building. It's talking about this place of your soul. He's filled up what was an empty, dark place in my soul. And so I can say now, oh, my soul. Christ came in and filled up this empty place. And so I would say to someone now who has that empty space, because everyone who does not have Christ dwelling in you, there is an empty space. And there are those who want to invite Christ in, but he's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. Have to, you have to invite him in, but he will only come into a clean place, a place that you allow him to clean. And so, and I, and I say that because I have in mind those um, gays and lesbians who believe that they can be Christian and gay at the same time. That, that is one of the, the, the lies that, 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 that Satan uh, is keeping people trapped in. That is an untruth that the Lord has sent me to tell you about. You cannot be Christian and gay at the, or lesbian at the same time, unrepented. Let's say you can't be an unrepented gay person. You cannot be, Christ can't live in you while darkness lives in you at the same time. It can't happen. But you, and I want you also to know the other, the other lie he wants to, to say to people who understand that is that Satan wants to say, you can never be free. You can never stop wanting women. You've been going with women for 30 years. I stand as evidence that the Holy Spirit can and will change you if you give God your whole heart. When you, when you pray, pray that God will come in to your whole heart and change your whole heart, not just to take the gay thing away, not just to take the lesbian thing away. It doesn't work like that. You have to give God all of you. He's changed many things in my life, not just the lesbian. I have you know, an anger problem. He's, you know, he's, he's had to break that up. So many things that we have in our lives that, that have to be turned over, all of us. Give God your whole heart and you will, uh, he'll put you back together again. And he absolutely loves you just 
like you are. I had a woman write me and say, you know, I think you're so wrong. You know, I, I applaud your change of life, but I think you're wrong because I know that God loves me just like I am. And I said, I agree with you. Sister, he does love you. I, I, I remember feeling that God loved me even when I was lesbian. I knew he loved me, but I also knew that I was sinning. He loves you just like you are, but he's waiting for you to love him just like he is. He is a certain way. He is holy. He has created in order. And whether we like it or not, that's the order he created. He's waiting for us just to love him just like he is. And when you decide, choose, and that's a wonderful thing he gave us, choice. When you choose to love God the way he is and simply follow his order and his word, he will come in and just change you and do such a, uh, put in you such a joy, such a peace. That's what I have. I have a peace that people don't understand. I don't understand myself. I have a peace and a joy that was not there before. I have a peace and a joy that, that, that people want after having uh, watched me and people who knew me you know, years ago. I got letters from people early on uh, when, I, when my, first, my testimony first came out. Um, I actually ran my testimony on the cover of Venus magazine. I figured if Oprah can be on her own magazine every issue, I can certainly put myself on the cover of one. But uh, so when my testimony came out there, um, people wrote some very angry letters. And one woman says, you know, how dare you harm our community? You know, you've been you know, you financed your life over the last 13 years from the backs of gays and lesbians. Now you're going to, you know, harm our community like this. That same woman, two years later, wrote me back and said, I never thought that I would be the one writing you back this letter to let you know that I've decided to, to come out of lesbianism and to give my life to Jesus Christ. And that makes the whole suffering worth it all. Worth it all. You may not be a famous black lesbian, but God has used something in Charlene's story to speak to you today. Don't turn away from God's voice. He loves you. He hasn't come to condemn you. He's come to set you free. He's come to heal you. He's come to give you real life and offer you real love. There is no greater love than this, that even while we continued in our sin, Christ gave up his life. He was crucified and he died. But three days later, he rose from the grave to demonstrate his victory over sin and death. Having paid the penalty for our sin, he came back from the grave to say, See, this is how much I love you. Turn to Jesus right now, and he will not count your sins against you. Heaven is free, but heaven is only for those who appreciate the sacrifice of the Son of God on the cross, and who respond by giving their life back to him. So give him your life today. Until next week, I'm Jason Graves for Pure Passion, praying that you will choose eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ.